Kalispera says, greetings everyone. Both good evening and good morning to all, no matter uh, where you're following us from. We've just passed our halfway point of our seminar series, and there's still quite a few more fascinating presentations in the pipeline yet to come. And it's most likely our program will be extended into October as well. Let me also say that this has been quite a monumental week uh, for the Greek community of Melbourne, where we saw the departure of Manus to Baragos, our principal and head of our language programs for the last seven and a half years. We'd like to thank, thank him for his efforts. He'll be sorely missed and we wish him a safe return to Greece. And in turn, uh, we'd like to congratulate his replacement, Maria Bacalido, who has already hit the ground running. We wish her all the best in a smooth transition and may she have plenty of productive years ahead. Uh, now let's return to tonight's seminar, where first I'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, Jenny uh, Proimos and Maria de Kiel in memory of Eleni Harris. The title of the seminar, uh, tonight's seminar is actually quite a long-winded one. Who fought whom in 1821 and where to find the Sultan? The socioeconomic situation of Moria, the Peloponnese, on the eve of the Greek Revolution. It's quite timely that this seminar comes almost immediately after the previous Monday seminar by the academic Haris Athanasiadis, who apart from dispelling many myths about the 1820 revolution, also stressed the global context, the complexity, and the multidisciplinarity, if there is such a word, of the issue. The 1821 Greek revolution was by no means a coherent affair as often portrayed in national historiography. In fact, what happened in 1821 were different insurrections with very diverse leaders and participants taking place in very different regions with distinct features and even with distinct motives. The speaker of tonight's seminar will examine pre-revolutionary uh, Peloponnese society and its socioeconomic structure. What was the situation on the ground between different groups and their interrelationships? What features of the Peloponnese made it more insurrectionary than other regions of Greece? Why were people willing to risk their livelihoods in the attempt to get grievances addressed? To explain all this and more, we're honoured to have with us Dr. Anna Vlachopoulou, an associate researcher at the Institute of Eastern and Southeastern European History in the Faculty of History and Arts at Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, Germany. She did her MA and PhD uh, where she looked at the local causes of the Greek Revolution and spent a few years in Istanbul doing research for her dissertation. When it comes to languages, uh, Dr. Vlachopuro is no slouch and is either highly fluent or has working knowledge of eight languages, German, Greek, English, French, Turkish, Ottoman, Ancient Greek, Ottoman, uh, and, and Latin. What can I say? May you reach double figures one day. Uh, presently, she's a participant in the research priority program, Transatomanica, working on a project on Greek merchant networks. Uh, Dr. Vlachopoulou, uh, the floor is yours. Um, um, good morning there in Munich. Thank you very much. Good evening there in Melbourne. Thank you very much for having me tonight and for allowing me to share my thoughts on the prehistory of the Greek Revolution. Thanks to um, Nick and the crew um, behind the scenes and like for setting up this event in this incredible professional um, way. I'm at awe at the technical possibilities we have. I also understand that the pandemic situation is kind of difficult in Australia. Please stay safe, everyone. At least we can meet in this um, way online and we all can um, keep our sweatpants on. I would like to, well, I'm gonna try to share my, See, I knew I would do something wrong. I'm sorry. Okay. Can you see my my screen? Yes. All good. Perfect. Right. So, I'm um, sorry for the long-winded title. Uh, it's probably a um, question of fantasy, but I would like to take you as a journey, as it were, into the um, Peloponnese in the so-called um, second Turkokratia, in the second Turkish reign or Ottoman reign, starting in 1715 when the Ottomans reconquered the Peloponnese from the Venetian, 
going up to 1821, to have a look together who the people were who, that lived um, in the Peloponnese and how they lived there um, and what was driving them in the eve of the revolution. Because I think that as historians, we always have to balance like this tension um, between different ways to look at history, namely between the detail and the big picture. So metaphorically speaking, we want to look at different trees, but we don't want to miss the forest for the trees. And the Greek Revolution is mostly presented in one big coherent um, event. And I feel we look at the forest, at the big picture, but we miss some trees. We miss like the individual components that make this picture. So what I mean is usually we have like what is presented, of course, is the Philikia Daria preparing for uprising. Then there's Ypsilandis and the, the other nobles. There's a European connection in the Enlightenment and um, the Greek intellectuals. And the impact of the French Revolution and all the intellectual and ideological content that emanates there's the Greek diaspora, mainly the merchants who act as messengers and sponsors. So there's a big, like a, a whole group of different people all over Europe seem to be part of this um, global event or this European event that is the Greek his, um, revolution. Global history, the latest trend in historiography makes the picture even bigger looking to fit um, the Greek revolution, not only into a European age of um, revolution, but now looking for global phenomena. And while all of these ways to depict the revolution or to look at it do have merits, don't get me wrong, and personally I'm a fan of global history, I still feel we lose sight, we are missing the trees as it were, we lose sight of the locality of where it started. Um, and we lose sight also of the significance of plain social and economic factors. And I think and this is what I would like to present to you tonight, that a closer look at the history and the situation of the Peloponnese has analytical value and maybe broadens our understanding and our interpretation um, of the Greek Revolution. So I want to introduce you to the Christian notables of the Peloponnese. Those of you who heard Professor Pet Mezas um, lecture here in the um, community in Melbourne, I think a couple of weeks ago, probably will recognize some things, some of the things I'm telling you. So after conquering an area, the Ottomans usually kept as many local features and traditions undisturbed as they possibly could. And this goes also for local elites, for clergy, for village elders. Most of them, um, most of the time, they were left in place with some freedom of activities, with some agency, as long as they kept public order and kept the money flow to the imperial treasure going. This is actually, or this is basically what the Ottomans were interested in. Public order and keep the taxes going. The Peloponnesian Christian elite, the so-called Kojabashe, also known as Prokriti, Pruchodes, Yerondes, Dimo Yerondes, there's different names, but Kojabashe is maybe the most used one and maybe also the most um, specific one. They came from old established family clans who had like always been there, like since time immemorial. <clears throat> they had always lived in certain areas, had always been important, rich, had money and property, and always had officials or had offices in the local self-government of the peninsula. Usually around the patriarch of the family, they formed a networks of immediate family members, relatives by marriage, kins and clients, and property and mostly also the offices 
were inherited within the clan and passed on from one generation to the next. Um, an example, to give you just one, um, and a name you will hear often tonight is the Deliyanis family. They were based in the Calavritad um, district. I marked it with an arrow just so we, not everybody has the villages of Peloponnese ready. Um, so th this is like the, the headquarters of, of um, the Lianis family in um, Caritana and the pater familia, Ioannis de Lianis, he held, like he's a he's good, good um, example for their functions and for their positions. He held the office of the provincial head of Caritana for 32 years. He served as a representative of the Peloponnese in Istanbul as a so-called vekil for three years. And he had the highest office of the provincial um, representative, like rep representing the province in the um, capital of um, in, in Tripoli. So he was this, this in this office for 16 years. So all of his life he had and um, at times more than one offices um, at the same time. His offices were um, temporarily taken over by his sons, Theodoros um, Deliyanis. His son Anagnostis went to Istanbul to be representative in Istanbul. And another son, Canelos Deliyanis, took care of the family property in Caritana. And Canelos Deliyanis, just for illustration, this is him, is also an important source um, and looms heavily over this presentation because he left us three volumes of memoirs from the time before the revolution, the revolution and afterwards, which I think is um, underestimated. I think it's a fascinating um, source. Now, I mentioned already the, the offices of communal or local self-government or self-administration and this is very closely connected to the Kochabashes. Institutions um, of local self-administrations did exist in the Ottoman Empire through all epochs and in different um, contexts. For example, by, by professional groups, the so-called esnaf, like guilds, in the urban districts, in the mahalle, there were um, representatives. And on the village level, the elders, they are called, um, well, Kojabashe, we call them in the um, Peloponnese, Chorbaje, they are called in Bulgaria, Knies, they are called in Serbia. So this is an institution that does exist um, almost everywhere. In the Balkan region, I'm no expert for the Arab provinces of the um, empire. Um, they had origins oftentimes in pre-Ottoman times and in the Peloponnese too. The community is a national grown institution, which in some places can be traced back as early as Byzantine Middle, Middle Ages. And the famous 17th century Ottoman traveler Evliya Celebi, he also, um, he has a trip to the, to the Peloponnese and he reports of village elders and others who were tasked with community administrations and therefore um, privileged in um, tax of, or freed, spared from tax payment actually. In the 18th century, like the time we are um, discussing, the Ottoman in the South, Southeast European provinces in the Balkans increasingly relied on the support of the local elites and the local self-government um, in order to fulfill their administrations, administrative tasks. The representatives of the self-government acted as a link between the Ottoman administration and the local population. They passed on instructions from the administration downwards, as it were, to the people, and they passed on petitions or complaints from the population upwards, as it were, back to the Ottoman um, officials. In addition, usually they were um, responsible for public order. 
for nonprofit institutions, like for you know the things everybody like common is commonly used, like roads, bridges, communal stuff like schools, churches, and things like that. So, and these two go together, the, the local elites, the Kojabashi, and the self-administration. The strong role of the Kojabashi and their function as administrators becomes apparent even before the Ottomans actually recapture um, the peninsula from the Venetians in 1715. Canelos de Lianis reports that the Ottomans were more or less invited by the um, Kojabashi. They were, Kojabashi and the Greek population of, of the Peloponnese was thoroughly tired of the rule of the Venetians and so the representatives of the most fam noble families of the Peloponnese, they agreed to hand over the peninsula to the Ottomans. So um, I'm just, this is an excerpt from the sources I've given you, my own English translation and um, for good measure, the, um, the, the, the Greek original. Now the, the Greek original has some funny, funny um, orthography, some funny grammar, and I'm sure there's a typo for which I'm responsible. But so maybe you can, um, you, you're not only depending on my, my English rendition, but here's the original also. So they agreed to um, hand over the, the peninsula. They meet, um, they, they go to Thiva, they meet Topal Osman, Osman Pasha, who is the commander of the Ottoman armed forces, and they offer him their homeland on their own accord so that it could be united with the Ottoman Empire. Topal Osman Pasha receives them with joy and showers them with honors and asks about their expectations regarding rights and privileges. And the notables reply that they want a democratic um, administration. And this is the in the original text, he says a democratic in the Kisin, and he also gives the Turkish word, um, which is well, he says Raya Ibaret. Now, this poses some problems because there is no such, such thing as a Raya Ibaret in the Ottoman. We, we, we don't know what that is, what, what he means exactly. So this is um, kind of a, remains a, we don't know. Um, Topal Osman Pasha apparently agreed. He obtained confirmation of these privileges from the Sultan in Istanbul. Um, and this is what happened. So here, probably the um, Raya Ibaret gets um, explained because he's um, uh, the Lianis tells us that until the revolution, the Peloponnese was governed without the local Turks. The local Turks could not interfere in any administrational matters. Only the Kojabashi and the the provost and the um, elder of each community, they um, managed the affairs of the, um, of the district, um, including the distribution of local taxes. So after the Venetians were finally driven from the, Pelopon um, um, from the peninsula and the Ottomans had established their, no, their, their new um, administration and their different institutions. This is um, how Canelos de Lianis, well, he doesn't remember himself, but this is how it, the time is remembered, that after the Ottoman conquest, in come the good times. The good times manifest itself in an unprecedented rise of the Peloponnesian Kojabashi in positions of power and influence and material wealth. In fact, the Kojabashis are able to operate surprisingly undisturbed by the interference from the provincial administration. They benefit both from the role in, in from their role in local self-government and from structures and conditions in the Ottoman Empire as they develop in the 18th century. And I told you before, 
like um, these Christian elites in the local self-government is not a Peloponnesian phenomenon, but when you dis when you compare the description of their position with, for example, um, the Serbians, like in, in the Belgrade area, this is not the same thing. These people here have a really, like this is a special thing. This is an unprecedented position they managed to um, put themselves in. The Ottoman administration practically from the beginning was in need of the cooperation of locals. The governments, no, the governors, sorry, they were sent from Istanbul to the provinces, oftentimes only for a couple of years. Um, later in the 18th century, they served only one year and then were replaced. So imagine here comes the new governor. He has no real idea of what's going on um, in the area and of the circumstances of the province. He has no power bases on his own, and he has the order to collect a certain sum of taxes and send it into um, to the imperial tre treasury ASAP. So he needs somebody on the ground to know what is going on and to help him, and he turns to the local elites. The Muslim nobles, the so-called Ayan, and the Christian nobles, the so-called Kojabashi. The court, court of the governor in Tripoli, in the capital of the Peloponnese, is a kind of mirror image of the court of the Sultan in Istanbul. And the Sultan has an imperial council, so the governor has a provincial council. Two councils, actually, and one of them is manned by the chief translator, by two representatives of the Muslim administration, of um, self-administration of the Ayan, and two representatives of the Christian um, self-administration. And these two Kojabashes of the highest ranks representing the Peloponnese in the, in, in the council, in the divan of the um, governor, in the sources and the literature are called Mora Ayan. Now, Mora is the Turkish name or the Ottoman name for, for the Peloponnese, which, of course, derives from the Moria. And, um, but still, the, the, the word is interesting because the Ayan is a title of the Turkish, of the, of the Muslim um, noble. But obviously, the Kojabashis, these two are put in the same category um, with their Muslim counterparts. So the two Ayan and the two Mora Ayan, so the two Greeks in this council, negotiate with the governor of the province about the amount of the tax to be collected and how it would be distributed among the various districts. After an agreement has been reached, the two Mora Ayan inform the assembly of the district representatives about the amount. And about the respective and about how much money the respective district has to rise. The district representatives, in turn, negotiate or take this information to the assemblage of the village elders and distribute the sum. And then the village elders take it into the different village and they figure out which household are they, you know distribute the tax sum to the household. So this is a very elaborate system working on, on different levels, like the province as a whole, the different the, the districts, and then the individual um, uh, villages. And um, basically, the money, once it is collected, takes the other way, um, the same way in reverse order and goes from village to district to the province. So this is a very institutionalized way of communication. Not all taxes were collected this way, but a considerable amount of the um, of taxes. And the Kojabash's role in this progress is significant. The cooperation of local Kojabashis is vital and gave them enormous leverage. And I would like to give you two um, 
examples from sources of um, how they are de depicted by, um, well, by, by, by the sources in their power, that without their permission and their opinion, no distribution of taxes on the reaya, on the taxable populations. Um, possible, says Mikhail Ikonomo. And there's another one which basically says the same, that without their um, permission, no taxation, basically, and their um, relationship with the Pasha was um, an very, like, was an important um, factor. And obviously, they had leverage. In addition, the tax collection, like, it strengthened the position of the Kojabasha in their own districts, because they often acted as, as money lenders to the taxable population, to the so-called Raya. If, if a Raya could not raise the required um, sum, we all know the problem. You don't have money, you need to take out a loan. And the loan that was mostly taken out from the local Kojabashi. This often led to a spiral of debt for the um, Reaya, which, which oftentimes ended with the Kojabashi collecting the securities invested, like lands, um, houses, vineyards, workshops, whatever um, the Reaya had. Another phenomenon of the 18th century in the Ottoman Empire connected to taxes is the spread of the system of tax farming as a fiscal practice. In the Peloponnese, too, there was more and more land converted to be tax farming areas. And these areas were then auctioned off in Istanbul to the highest bidder. So basically, you um, you rent out an, an air, you pay a lump sum, and you acquire the right to collect taxes in this specific area you have rented for more or less a year or longer. And um, this has the benefit for the imperial treasury that they have a fixed sum, they know how much they are getting. And of course, for the tax farmer, um, he is well, he will try to press as much money out of his tax um, area in order to get some return on his investment, um, right? So this system is a heavy burden on, again, the tax buying um, population. Exists in the whole of the Ottoman Empire and gets even wider and more elaborate in the 18th century because the Ottoman Empire is in constant need of money. Um, another thing is that the, the, the respective tenants were mostly not concerned with the practical administration of their tax farm area on the ground, but had it administered by representatives or leased them out again to somebody else who then again wanted um, paid some money and then wanted some return on um, his um, investment. In both cases, administration and subrent, the Kojabashi were suitable candidates because they knew the local conditions, they had experience in collecting taxes, they had the capital to pay the rent, um, so they were heavily involved. For Just to give you one example, Panayot Benaikis, he's a Kojabashi in Kalamata, and he has at least, he is a subtenant of at least 24 tax farms in and around Kalamata, including taxes on salt, on oil, and on silk. As I said, tax farming usually means a high, a very high burden for the taxable population. And um, especially this, this um, habit or this, this um, yeah, the habit of splitting the areas into sub, um, rents was a, created a lot of problems and also f um, fostered the building of private um, property of landed, big landed estates. So the Peloponnesian and Kojabashi used their role in self-government, their connection to the Ottoman administration and their position within the communities to increase their possession 
to consolidate their position. This naturally leads to rivalries and competition, both with other Qajabashis and with their Muslim counterparts, with Ayans. Alliances and factions were formed consisting of Christian Qajabashis and Muslim Ayan, who were in competition with other factions consisting of Kojabashi and Ayan. And all, all of them tried to get the Ottoman provincial administration on their side and to maintain contacts with the power center in Istanbul. This, the latter, the contact with Istanbul was done by the, I mentioned it already, so-called Vekil, which is people living in Istanbul, representing the, the peninsula or the interest of whoever sends them um, there. The government, no, the governor of the Peloponnese for his part is also interested in the support of one or another faction and try to use the rivalries between the factions for his own purpose. There's a Contemporary observer, his name is Suleiman Penach Effendi. I have not found a, his picture, but this is his son, and I suppose there is some resemblance, just for illustration. Like Suleiman Penach Effendi left a memorandum on the conditions of the Peloponnese, again, a very interesting and important um, source. And he also mentions the cooperation of the notables and their effects of the um, on the taxable populations. So um, the Kojabashis, he says, teams up with the Vali, the, the governors, the judges, officers, and the Ayan, and they all together bully um, the Reaya, the taxable population. This is how he depicts it. And, uh, and we, I suppose there's some... So these competitive battles between um, the factions were sometimes really bitter. Like the aforementioned, the Ioannis Velianis from Karitana, he was, again, just to give you an example, in a bitter competition with Haseki Ali A from Lala. Haseki Ali had apparently cast an eye on Greek landholding in Kalavrita district and try to drive away the Christian farmers. This is this goes against the interests of Yanis the Lianis, who either wanted or who wanted either taxable farmers uh, resident in the area or take over the property himself. So the conflict between these two notables is, um, seems to be really escalating, since Haseki Ali hired a contract killer to get the Lianis out of the way. He missed his goal. Ioannis the Lianis survived, but he was um, severely wounded and, and handicapped afterwards. And um, apparently he retaliated by intriguing against Haseki. And this is how his son tells us or de depicts the end of this situation that around um, um, 1800, he says, um, his father accomplished and destroyed um, Haseki Ali A. So there's the first typo, um, who the government, the Ottoman government murdered due, due to the Lianis actions. So here we have another example, or I think it's the first example of how they use the Ottoman officials by intriguing, by um, maybe bribing by whatever for their own um, purpose. So there is this, this, and this is, you will see a, a, a through line that um, through the whole history that there is always this involvement involving the Ottoman officials for whatever it is, the Ayans, uh, the, the Kojabashi. Um, Need. So I'm going to skip another example because um, I think I'm I'm lagging it back and I'm, I'm too slow already. But this is just an example for the vehemence with which the Peloponnesian notables fought each other, and also for the fact, as I said, that they involve Ottoman officials. This infighting came to an end when, in 1770, 
in the wake of a Russian Ottoman war, the Russians instigated an uprising on the Peloponnese to distract the Ottoman forces. And just for illustration, um, uh, the Tsarina Katarina II and Grigory Orlov, probably her lover and the one who comes to the Peloponnese to instigate this uprising. We talk about the Orlov uprising in, in um, historiography. Um, because they wanted to distract Ottoman um, forces. Some of the Kojabashis seized the opportunity to change the power relation in the province, collaborated with the Russians and tried to lead um, the Peloponnese into an uprising, which was poorly prepared, chaotic and brutal. It was plagued by misunderstanding between the Russians and the Greeks and all supported only by a small part of the Christian population. It was a mess and it ended after several months with the withdrawal of the Russian fleet and the brutal suppression of the rebels by Albanian mercenaries who had been brought in to help suppress the uprising by the Ottoman um, administration. And these Albanians caused the next troublesome um, episode because after putting down the uprising, they refused to leave the peninsula and return to their home bases. Instead, they installed their own reign of terror. And we have marauding mercenary gangs basically roaming the peninsula, robbing, plundering, enslaving, extorting protection money, Another, it was, um, and it was not until 11 governors and nine years later. So for nine years, these Albanians had this terror um, reign on the Peloponnese and 11 governors were not able to take them out or, you, you know, which also tells you something about the efficacy and the efficiency of um, administration uh, of Ottoman administration at this time. But nine years later, finally, Greek and Ottoman forces combined finally managed to drive out the Albanians. Um, and after so many years of turmoil and terror, the peninsula returns finally to some sort of normalcy and everybody is busy, busy consolidating their own situations, making up for losses, collecting themselves. Um, until around 1806, 1807, the rise factors come together, which upset um, the situation once again and start this elite rivalry like the elite rivalry comes back with a vengeance. Because in 1806, there's another Rus Russia Turkish, uh, Russian Ottoman war, and the Peloponnesian Ayans have um, evidently felt remembered from the one to the one before, which had brought the uprising, and asked the, the um, imperial government for protection. And this led to the appointment of Veli Pasha as a governor of the Peloponnese. Veli Pasha is the son of the powerful and more or less independent governor of Epirus in the north, Ali Pasha of Yanina. I'm sure you have heard of him. Um, and this brings in another, a, a, an additional power factor because um, those who had good relations with Veli, the son and governor, um, also had Ali, the father and um, powerful Ayan, on his on their side immediately. So these two go together, and this makes good relations with the with the Peloponnesian um, governor even more important. And no good relations even more troublesome. So this leads to a blatant shift in the equilibrium on the Peloponnese because one of the powerful Kojabashis, Sotiraikis Londos from Vostica, 
he had um, and he is the head of a large Kojabashi faction. He had had earlier contacts with Ali Pasha. So when it comes to establishing relationship with the son of Ali Pasha, Londo starts from the pole position, so to speak. The rival faction around Ioannis Veliyanis from Calavrita, uh, Caritana, sorry, um, and the opponent of Londos, he tries to prevent Veli Pasha's appointment with the help of their representative in um, Istanbul. So there is a frantic power play, but without success. Veli Pasha takes office, he comes to Tripoli, and he soon gets into a conflict with a powerful um, Muslim Ayan from Lala and with their leader, um, uh, Ali Farmaikis. The background of this conflict is not clear, but um, every explanation we can find in sources indicate that um, there is an intra-elite conflict that is waged by manipulating the governor into the situation. So one version says that Ali Farmaikis was incited to obey the governor by the Lianis, and that the Lianis hoped that the governor would arrest Ali Farmaikis and maybe even execute him and thereby eliminate him as an opponent. Another source says that it's actually two of Ali Farmaki's uncles, like in his old family, that turned the governor against their nephew because they wanted to eliminate Ali as a competitor in the allocation of offices. There are other, other versions um, floating too. We don't know what the real background is of the conflict, but we clearly see again that there is an intra-factional or even familial con um, conflict, which is waged by bringing um, the forces of the Ottoman governor into um, the play. And another factor that now comes up and the Peloponnesian elites try to use for their purpose at the same time is the presence in, of the French who had occupied the Ionian Islands in um, 1797. The Kojabashi faction of, that, of the Ioannis de Lianis hatched a plan in which the French played the decisive role. A coalition of those governments, uh, sorry, of those Kojabashi who were not preferred by Veli Pasha, the Ioannis um, fraction, and the Ayan who were dissatisfied for whatever reason with the governor, they all came together in a big conspiracy and agreed to offer the Peloponnese to the French. Under the protection of Napoleon, the plan says, Equality was to prevail in the Peloponnese in the future, and all areas of administration were to be regulated by mutual agreement by two Christians and one Muslim. And the head of the whole thing would be Napoleon. So this is how um, the Liani son depicts it or tells us in the, in the sources, this is what they thought that equality would prevail and they would share um, administrational duties. And of course, we see here clearly the power relationship is to change to two Christians and one, of, and one Turk in decisive roles in each district. So this plan clearly sees a establishment of Kojabashi dominance in the province. To seal the agreement, um, some, some of the con, um, conspirators swore on the Quran, others of the Bible, and they um, wanted to see themselves as brothers in the future. So there were, in fact, contacts with the French governor of the Ionian Islands, but no future development because in 1809 the um, Ionian Islands were conquered by the English and the French were gone and there is no, you know, there's no outcome from this um, 
a practical outcome from this conspiracy. But this um, episode not only shows the hardened fronts in the intra-elite conflict, it also shows the increasing vehemence of the conflict and the readiness of the notables to take radical measures to change um, the situation to their favor or in their favor. Of course, this is a specific group that wants the change. Those who just seem to have lost the rivalry. Under different circumstances, these same people might not have joined a conspiracy, namely when they benefited from the given situation. So this is not an, an, a universal conspiracy. This is the conspiracy of the disenchanted. The Kojabash's attitude towards the Ottoman administration is shaped by personal interests. It's not ideology or the universal desire to change the system, but rather situationally motivated personal dissatisfaction with the balance of power. This is also indicated by the willingness of the Kojabashi to continue um, to live and cooperate with the Muslim Ayan, but in the right ratio, with Kojabashi dominance, two Christians and one Muslim. Interestingly, there's another source telling us about the plan to bring the French in. Theodoros Kolokotronis, I'm sure you all have heard about him, the famous cleft and later the hero of the revolutionary fight. He too has been involved in this whole thing, in the conflict between Veli Pasha and Ali Farmaikis. He takes the side of um, Ali Farmaikis. He helps him um, fight against Ottoman troops because this is a real, as a real thing going on. And together, Kolokotronis and Ali Farmaikis have to flee from the Peloponnese to the Ionian Islands. Kolokotronis also reports of the conspiracy against Veli Pasha. Only in his version, it's himself and Ali Farmaiki are the ones who come up with the plan and then convince the Kojabashi to join them. He also gives more detail about the implementation of the plan. He, he describes the new flag that the um, Peloponnese would have and how they would live under Napoleon's freedoms. And he also sort of expresses the aim of the conspiracy because he says the plan was after all is said and done um, and and the Peloponnese is under French administration to write to the Sultan in Istanbul and tell him, we didn't rise against you, but against the tyrant Veli Pasha. So even with the conspiracy not succeeding, Veli Pasha was not to stay in the Peloponnese much longer. And when he was called to the front, because there's an ongoing war, um, the dissatisfied Kojabashi seized the opportunity and um, with the help of their representatives in Istanbul obtained his dismissal. But the rivalries between the, the Kojabashi factions continued, intensified and claimed more victims. Among them, and this is the climax, the heads of the two big rival rivaling fashions Factions. In September 1812, Sotirakis Londos is executed by the governor, the successor to Veli Pasha in the office of governor. We don't know the, the um, reason there is an, or the exact background. There is again an, an in, intrigue um, going on behind the scenes that obviously made the governor to um, execute Londos. <clears throat> this um, puts Ioannis de Lianis then in the in the um, front position in this rivalry, um, but he too did not enjoy his new position for long because he was executed in February 1816 by the new governor of the province. So the death of the leaders of these factions marks the climax of the Kojabashi rivalry in the Peloponnese. 
and testifies to the vehemence which was, with which these rivalries were fought and carried out. Um, this, the death of Londos and, and the Lianis on the one hand clears the way for new leaders and on the other hand the notables themselves seem to be shocked by this deadly escalation. What follows is a kind of ceasefire which even was put in writing. Apparently the Kojabashis now wanted to prevent a repetition of the escalation and decided to jointly pursue common interests. Old habits are difficult to beat and thus the two main rival factions each made a written declaration, each postulating unity and the pursuit of common interests. The trend thus is obviously towards constituting um, themselves as a interest group and finally pulling together to get things um, or for their common interest. I think this could well, very well be interpreted as the point in time when the Kojabashi's attitude fundamentally changed. Under the prevailing balance of power, Kojabashi's goals could not be achieved. And instead of getting ayans and governors on their side and playing these different people, um, they, the decision emerged to jointly strive for change in the balance of power in the Peloponnese and to change it in their favor. This is also supported maybe by the fact that over time, more and more Peloponnesians, like the Kojabashi, had been accepted and initiated into the ranks of the Filikia Teria, um, which now also, like, comes on, on, on um, to the scene. As you all know, um, Filikieteria had been founded in 1814 uh, in Odessa and had since been recruiting um, members. And the Kojabashi, most um, Peloponnesian um, notables, high clergy, but also like Theodoros Kolokotronis, they were all members, initiated members. So transformation seems to be in the air and um, well, the outbreak of the revolution will come, will just, is just around the corner more or less and comes in a few years. I hope that these examples and these stories out of the life of the Kojabashi were illustrative in more than one way. And I hope they were entertaining too. What they show is this through line when it comes to the Kojabashi from the beginning in 1715 to the outbreak of the revolution in 1821, these people fight each other and their Muslim peers. The Peloponnesian society in Ottoman reign is divided by social lines, maybe more than by ethnic or religious lines. On the one side, there is this elite group of Muslim Ayan and Christian Kojabashi. And of course, the Ayan are part of the local elite. And as Muslims, they are part of the dominant class in the empire. The Kojabashi are only, quote, quote, local elites. And as Christians, they remain in second rank. But nevertheless, the communalities between these groups are far more are far bigger than between the Kojabashi and their Christian brethren um, of lesser economic might. The Kojabashi have much more in common with Ayan than they have in common with the olive farmers in the um, area of Kalamata. Their lifestyle, their clothes, their habitus, their position, their status, Remember, resemble the Ayan more than the Greeks, the Reaya. And they are perceived as like in this resemblance. So Finlay, um, Scottish historian, writes um, that the, well, describes them as a, as a kind of Christian Turks, which is, this, is a term he probably took from, from Leek, uh, Martin Leek. I think Martin is his name, who is a 
uh, um, English spy and travelers and, and widely traveled the Peloponnese in the Ottoman times and left another three or four volumes of descriptions. And he, I think this is more, more his um, term, the Christian Turks. There are more um, examples of people, sources, Greece, Greek sources also comparing Kojavashis and Greeks. And also in summer 1821, Dimitrios Ypsilantis lands on the Peloponnese. He is the brother of um, Alexandros Ypsilantis, who started an uprising in the Danubian principalities. Dimitris Ypsilantis comes to the Peloponnese to claim leadership, and he is clashing with the, Otto, with the Kojabashi, because Kojabashi didn't want outside interference in what they considered to be their business. The revolution is ongoing. We are in June, I think, of 21. The rumor spreads that Ypsilantis would leave, and this rumor mobilized people. The people, the reaya, the, the people that lived in the place, um, the soldiers gathered at the mansion where the Kojabashis is, were lodging and basically wanted to lynch them. And they called them Turk worshippers and Turk Kojabashis. So somebody um, steps out um, of the mansion where these people live, where the Kojabashis live, and he asks, asks the rebel. This is how Canelos de Lianis talks about the people. What did they want, he asks them. And they answered, we want the Turk worshippers, Turkolatras, I, this is how I translated it. Um, because they say they don't want the master, and the master is Ypsilandi, and now he's about to leave. And when they are asked, what do they mean? What is, who is this Turk worshippers? They ask, they answer, they answer the Turko Kotsabasides the Turk Kojabashi. So here too, people um, can make a direct connection and a comparison more or less to between the Turks or an equivalency of Turks and Kojabashis because this is how they are perceived in their elite status. Um, in the um, Peloponnese. So Kojabashi, Ayan, and Ottoman administration, they all fight relentlessly for resources and control over resources. This is another through line, as we have seen. Sounds kind of Marxist, which I don't mean to, but this is actually what happens. And this allows us to draw in inferences and conclusions maybe about the life of the non-elite, the Reaya, the taxable population, which left little to no sources, and we have the, our only way um, to, to approach them are indirectly by ways of inferences. But the Reada, the, the Reaya are the ones who produce the resources. They work the land and the olive trees and the vineyards and the fisheries and the silkworms. The Peloponnese is an agrarian society, and there is little or no, little to no manufacturing. And agriculture pro produce is the export good. And the fight for resources is fought on their backs, on the Reaya's back. They have to fight with ever higher taxation, not only by the state itself, but amplified by tax farming and um, other fees in. Dues. They turn into debt, they run into debt because of all the taxes and fees and money that is wanted for them. They take up loans at high interest rates and they probably lose their land or their cattle because they can't repay the loan. Many leave their villages. There's lots of, of examples in the sources of deserted villages to take, they take to the mountain to avoid debt bondage. They lived through an uprising in 1770, followed by nine years of terror by the Albanian mercenaries, and then they are plagued by the clefts, by armed robber bands who steal and kidnap and roam the Peloponnese until they are ousted in 1806. 
And then in 1815, when Europe finally gets rid of Napoleon, the European economy and trade take off again, and this leads to an economic recession in the Peloponnese, because the peninsula has heavily benefited from increased demand of grains and other produce during the Napoleonic War. Now, now suddenly the prices drop and suddenly, and with the prices, the wages um, drop. So at the eve of the revolution, the Peloponnesian Reaya had every reason to want to change the situation and the system that kept them in the situation. And I know I'm going over, bear with me, I'm going to be quick now. The intriguing thing here is that the Kochabashi are part of the system which, against which the revolution is directed. Most of the Reaya pay part, if not all, taxes to the Kojabashi. If they need a loan, they turn to the Kojabashi. When they lose their land and, and um, because they can't repay the loan, they lose it to their local Kojabashi. Most of the Reaya probably deal with Kojabashi in his administration, fun administrative function, much more often then they deal with an Ottoman official. Ottoman Muslim population on the Peloponnese is about 10%. Christian population is about 90%. Chances are you have much more to do with your, with your Kojabashi than with an Ottoman official. The episode with the Mitris Ypsilandis indicates that the Peloponnesians that are young were willing to sacrifice the local Kojabashi in order to keep the foreign prince, the one that was not a Peloponnesian, because their own people, their Kojabashis, they knew them and they obviously didn't want them anymore. On the other hand, the Kojabashi remain subjects. They too have to pay taxes and all their wealth notwithstanding, they are still exposed to the arbitrariness of the administration and they are in constant danger of losing their property and even their lives to the machinations of a rival faction. And as Christian subjects, they remain in a subordinate position. The social advancement has clear limits by the structure of the state, which favors Muslims. And like, despite all the social ascent, as Christians, they always remain in second line. Official positions are reserved for Muslims. Um, tax farming is reserved for Muslims. Kojabashis can supplant. Um, and even in accumulating wealth, the Ayan, the Muslim counterpart, had also always more possibility and more access. The Kojabashis at the eve of the revolution had maxed out. They had reached what they could reach in the given circumstances. And further up mo upwards, mobility and social ascent required a change of circumstances. And I think they changed sides, as it were, and joined an uprising. And I owe you one last player. Um, this is going to be a quick one. Where's the Sultan? The Sultan is surprisingly absent in Peloponnesian sources and in the, dis in the descriptions of what is moving them. This is a problem for me because I can't prove absence to you. I, what I can tell you is there is very little to no reference in to throwing off the reign of the Sultan, no reference to the tyranny of the Sultan. The Sultan as the representative of this system um, of suppression or of anything is not a point of reference. The point of reference for the Kojabashi and as far as we can trace it for the Reaya is the governor of the province. 
The governor is good and righteous. If he favors Kojavashis, he is bad and tyrannical if he doesn't favor them. The point of reference in the Peloponnese is not the empire, is not the sultan, is not Greece, and I think not the nation. It's the local peninsula, it's the Peloponnese. And I hope we can get into some form of dialogue and I would love to see somebody. And I'm sorry I went over time. What, what, what do I do? Yes, just, just stay there. Stay there. Um, firstly, um, Dr. Vlachopoulos, thank you for such a um, fascinating um, seminar. Um, you did bring to light a perspective and narrative um, we don't hear uh, too often. Um, I'm sure there'll be many questions. I've got <laughs> quite quite a few myself. I'm just trying to see um, where to start now. Um, oh, as I said, I've, you made some interesting points there, and it also reminded me of that expression, dizaimis dibraimis, so, <laughs> uh, which... Hey. Which has a lot of truth in it. It didn't. The, the, it didn't. It didn't matter which yoke you were under. You, were, you know, as a as a peasant, you were still sort of suppressed and had grievances. And um, it's very interesting to see that very sort of strong class dimension to the uh, to the Greek Revolution. But my, my question um, is something different. Um, often, a narrative you hear about the Ottoman Empire is that the Christians or the the, the Greeks as sort of Christian subjects were they had demi status. Uh, as people of the book, and um, they were protected. And the church of the patri patriarch uh, was, let's say, the leader of the flock, and uh, it was his job to sort of keep the flock in place. But according to your narrative, you almost, the church wasn't even sort of mentioned. It was the Kochibashi class. They had the main role, <laughs> let's say, in keeping uh, the Greek presence uh, in place. Can you elaborate on that? Um, I'll try, Nick, because this is a very important and, and um, intriguing question. And actually, you, you put your hand on a, or you put, put your thumb on a um, discussion that is going on, more or less, that has been going on forever. And I'm not sure that it is, um, that, that we solved it, which is the, 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 the millet question, that what, how are they, the, the non-Muslim entities in the in the Ottoman Empire constituted, and how are they how are they um, a, approached? Because it's not only the Christian. There's a Jewish millet also, and later then Catholics form an extra community and such. So um, the the thing is that that I would say that the Ottomans have a tendency to keep things fluent and not really define them. What, what we know about, like like what you said, the head of the flock, the patriarch being the head of the flock and being responsible for this starts this starts to get more prevalent with the Greek Revolution, and then later on into the Tanzimat um, uh, reforms that start after the Greek um, Revolution and are probably inspired by the first province, the Peloponnese that really breaks away from the Ottoman Empire. Before that, that like this, all these things are not uh, institutionalized. Like we know from, from Ottoman sources, they refer to the Kojabashi. They confirm the, the election of a Kojabashi, but at the same time, it is the community never is a corporate Entity is that how how you how you say it? So it is that, that, that it, it doesn't have a um, um, a, a rightful status. It's just there, but it's not really. It has no rights, and it's not clearly defined. So this is this funny thing, which goes through in the Ottoman um, uh, Empire administration, and I think actually gives them a huge degree of flexibility and this is probably why it why it functions relatively good the simi studies is more referred to a protection on a religious um level let's say so nobody can um you know violently convert you to islam or 
um, punish you for not being a sultan, uh, if, sorry, for not being a Muslim, I should say. Um, so the, the, the Zimmi thing is more a, a um, um, religious um, problem and everything else is very fluent. And the Kojabashis, yes, in practice, this is what they are doing. But of course, I'm, I should, like, as, a, um, as an example, the, the Metropolit of um, Patras, or Palion Patron Germanos, or Metropolitis Germanos, he too is considered a Kojabashi. So the Kojabashi, it, it, there's also clergy probably, there is, you know, they are both, they are clergy and um, administrators, so they do play a role also. And I'm sure I have not answered your question fully, but... No, no, it's a, it's a, it's a input, maybe. No, no, you did. Thank you for that. It's a comment. It is. Um, we are posting the questions on the uh, private chat, Anna, but I'll also read them out as well. One from John Consulis. Did the Ottomans plan from the beginning to actively encourage the Kochabashi factions all over Greece over the centuries as a way of suppressing a coordinated uprising? Uh, were the factions ever loyal to the Ottomans or just to themselves? Could I have the first part of the of the? Yeah, um, okay. yeah. it's also in your chat. Uh, did the Ottomans plan from the beginning to actively encourage the Kochabashi factions all over Greece um, over the centuries as a way of suppressing a coordinated uprising, um, or yeah. okay. they saw the circumstances there and that was the best way to deal with the issue? Yeah, and that's the first part. And the second part, I, the I, I have it now. I have it now in front of me. Thank you. Yeah. Um, no, no, the Ottomans didn't plan. I, I don't think the Ottomans planned to use the Kojabashi for anything. The Kojabashi were there and they were a fact on the ground and they needed them for um, carrying out their administration, administrative task. And especially collecting taxes is um, something that is sort of farmed out to the communities all over southeastern Europe. Same goes for Serbia. I know Serbian sources. I suppose same goes for um, um, Bulgaria and I could imagine Anatolia as well. But as I said, I'm, I'm no expert for the Anatolian or even the Arab um, um, provinces. So I think they just happen to be there and they happen to be used with no plan. The thing in the Peloponnese is that this is where they become so powerful, not by, by design, but because of the circumstances. Um, because the Peloponnese has so little um, Muslim um, population, because the Peloponnese is no frontier region, there is not much need, for example, to have a lot of military stationed in the Peloponnese. When you look at Belgrade, for example, where the Habsburg Empire is just on the other side of the um, of the river, there is a huge military presence that makes it much more difficult for local elements to thrive. The Peloponnese has military and has Ottomans stationed in the fortresses in in the in the coastal area. You know, Methoni, Koroni, Nafplion. And they have, and there is um, Ottoman military presence and Ottoman presence in in Tripoli. And other than that, this is a, a rural area. They are more or less left to their own devices. So this is a, one of the factors why they could thrive so much. The 18th century is um, like a characteristic of the 18th century is the the rise of these local elements because the central administration in Istanbul basically has lost control. And the Tanzimat um, reforms, I don't know if you had or you will have, I think, a lecture on Tanzimat also, like the reform movement of the sultans basically that starts in 1839, so shortly after Greece or the peninsula breaks away, um, is actually a centralizing mission for the, the, the sultans trying to regain control and to pull in the reins. So I don't think they use the Kojabashis for anything planned. Yeah. Um, 
I, and I think, yeah, yeah, I think you've answered the question. Um, thank you for that. Yeah, um, and while it was a decentralized empire, that's why you had a lot of um, power uh, power centers. You know, like in, in Yanino and Egypt and so forth. A lot of local war right. victims and them. Um, yeah, um, a question from um, Ange Kenos. How dangerous were the? I think he means um, probably a spelling error there. The uh, Brujondes. How dangerous? Yeah, or, or basically, who exactly were they? How were they different to the Kochabashi? Let me probably rephrase that question. I'm trying to understand it. Um, I, I think they were basically, you know, this is also, this is a leveled, you are richer and you have more influence and you are less rich and you have less influence. So I, I guess the Kochabashi, um, but again, there is no official term for them, and there is no official way of addressing them. I think the Kojabashi, usually we mean like the highest ranks of these um, of this social groups. They are called, as I said, the, the, the two highest ones are called the Mora Ayan, so the Ayan of the, of the um, Peloponnese. But again, this is not an official title because it's not officially an office that you can hold. Um, the Brujondes and the, the Prokriti, they are then on different levels. You have, you have village elders who have not the same influence as um, as a as the Lianis have but has but still is a part of the um, self administration and still plays a vital role in this um, system. So does that is is that Yeah no no I think I might have mis misinterpreted the uh, the transliteration. I think you said Prodot is the trader, so I suppose people who try to sort of play both sides, but I suppose you get that in in any type of situation where there's competition. So yeah. For influence and um, yeah. Um, it's got a, another question. Um, with the Turkish, let's say, bounty derived from agricultural taxes, did um, Greece's food situation change from time to time? Was food bountiful or scarce in the Peloponnese? Did this affect uh, negotiations? Um, yes, I would. I would think that. Um, like I, I don't have. Um, a special like like I don't have an example of food scarcity right now in my head, and I'm sure as soon as we finish the session, it's gonna come to me. But yes, um, okay, agricultural um, produce was export good, especially um, grain. Um, the Peloponnese also is a grain, um, like delivers grain, uh, supplies grain to the the to Istanbul and. As you maybe know, in early modern um, societies, to have the the capital um, of an empire um, supplied with enough bread and grain is crucial to keep public order. People rebel and and rise up when there is not enough food in the capital, and this is a, this is um, dangerous because in the capital there is the emperor, and he doesn't want. Um, um, any uprising. So the Peloponnese is important because they supply grain and they also sell grain to Europe, especially during the Napoleonic um, wars. This leads also to monoculture, like there is ever greater um, areas of land put into to agricultural use. And yes, the food situation did change, especially for the um, Reaya. Um, there is bad harvests. There is, you know, weather conditions in 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 pre-modern or early modern society. The agrarian population or the, the the agrarian societies are heavily depending on the forces of nature. Um, of course, there is money if you are out of money because you had to to. Um, to pay your taxes or to pay back your credit and they took your cow or your your sheep and you know there yeah there is food scarcity not as far as i know not com comparable at all to what happened during world war 2 because this is an, like no it's not the same thing but 
I'm sure that there is poverty and there is poverty and food scarcity for the Reaya, not so much for the higher ups. Okay. Um, uh, thank, thank you for that. We've got a question here from um, Adoni. Um, this political and social structure that you uh, described in the Peloponnese, uh, also in Mani, or was Mani exception? Sorry. Sorry, can't. Yeah, okay. I the, was the, like, can't, yeah. can't. This, pol this political and social structure you described in the Peloponnese, uh, was it throughout the Peloponnese? Was it also in Mani uh, in Laconia? Was Mani an exception? Yes and no. Um, Mani is a very interesting, and I didn't have time to go into that. Mani is a very interesting place because they have this, this from time immemorial, this the system of the Bay families. Um, the Mani, for a time, actually administratively is taken out of the um, Peloponnese, is not administered by the Peloponnesian governor, but is part of. The, the province that belongs to the admiral of the fleet. And this also is an interesting factor because when you are um, chased as a, as a, um, a cleft, for example, a, a, like the, from, from Kolokotronis, we know that he and his, his, his fellow, like, like, like his, his brother bands, they, they sort of cross the border into the Mani and then they are out of reach from the Ottoman Peloponnesian um, officials. So the Mani is a very interesting place. The Mani is also approached, for example, by French um, um, emissaries because, yes, everybody in this European, um, like in, in, in this European mix-up of the French are in the in the Ionian Islands and the English fight the French in the Mediterranean and the French have their foothold in, in um, uh, Egypt by that time. So the Eastern Mediterranean and the Peloponnese is approached by European um, powers in order to gain um, allies or to gain footholds uh, or in case, you know, there is um, a way of um, actually occupying territory as they did in the Ionian Islands. So the Mani also is approached by um, these, by, by Europeans. The Mani has this, this um, special um, situation. And I think I've lost my train of thoughts and uh, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Not, not right. We might finish just with one more question. Um, I've just been trying to find that um, some work that you might have published and I see that in November, you're an editor, along with others, of a book called Trans Ottoman Biographies. Will some of the stories described tonight appear in that book that's coming in November? No, no, not, not in that book. Um, I have, like, like I have my dissertation published, unfortunately, in um, German. This is a book that's av yeah. available, but as I said, in German all, only. Um, I do owe, oh, and Janis, if you're listening, I'm doing my best to, to make everything ready for you. I, I'm working at the moment on a paper with a related topic that will hopefully appear in a collective volume from in Melbourne, like, like the editors are, are in, in uh, Melbourne. So this then will be a, an English text on this one. And the book you mentioned is part of my new research project, my current one actually, on Greek merchant diaspora in the 19th century. This will be on in, in English available, inshallah, in November. Um, uh, and but it will it, it has it's, it's something completely different. Okay. Interesting though, because it's again. Greek diaspora, and this is a global, a more, much more global. No, it's, um, it's also another reason to have you back sometime in the future as well. So. Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to. I would like to tell you about the Rallis family and how they conquered the world. This is my ongoing research project right now. Um, Dr. Vlachopoulou, thank you once again for your time. Um, it, was, um, it was great having you. Um, and it, Thank you so much. Thank you. For your patience.
Um, and um, hopefully one day we can sort of meet in person, either in, well, preferably in Europe, because we're sort of stuck here in Australia, <laughs> or one day in Melbourne. Uh, best of whenever, luck. Whoever whoever comes to Munich, give me a call. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone, and hope to see you. Um, hope you can tune in next week's seminar by Dean Kalimnio, the Greek Revolution and its impact on the Middle East. Thank you.